most of us live affected by the external culture around us, a worldly culture around us. And if you've checked recently, the worldly culture, although we have a lot of things to make life easier, is becoming more complicated. The values we once could talk about as a community, we can no longer assume. We can't assume the value of family and what that looks like. It's just all changed. We can't assume the value of love and what that looks like because we have a cultural idea rather than a biblical idea. Even relationships are very, very difficult these days. So when we start to talk about a kingdom, when we start to talk about community, when we start to talk about love and relationship and serving, we have to redefine what it is we're actually talking about. Because the kingdom and the expression of God through Scripture as truth and life does not look like what we've come to understand through culture. So that when I talk about things that I'm going to this morning, about that thorny word, submission, most of us will go, "Mm." there'll be something in you that will go, oh, yeah, we'll see. You see, when we come to Jesus... We come into an altar of a covenant of marriage. And the the idea of that salvation is that God says, if you're willing to lay down that life, you can pick up my life. You can lose the lower life and you can pick up the greater life. But it's not just about you. It's about a people coming together and living in that way where honor and submission are the one expression of love that gives you access to the full generosity of the authority of God. You see, we think in worldly terms and in cultural terms instead of biblical terms. And there has to be a shift in our heart and in our understanding if we're going to start to change the culture within us and the culture around us. And I want to suggest this to you. There is a heart cry today like never before of lostness. Lostness in family, lostness in relationships, and even lostness in the church. Who would think we would be lost in the church? But it's true, because we put performance above relationship. Have a look at this. Some of you may have social media. Who's, who's got a smartphone? Yeah. Who's got an iPad? Who's got the internet? How much time do you spend on it? Ah, let's have a look at this clip. Thank you, Samurai Warrior. I have 422 friends, yet I'm lonely. I speak to all of them every day, yet none of them really know me. The problem I have sits in the spaces between looking into their eyes or at a name on a screen. I took a step back and opened my eyes. I looked around and realised that this media we call social is anything but when we open our computers and it's our doors we shut. All this technology we have, it's just an illusion. Community, companionship, a sense of inclusion. Yet when you step away from this device of delusion, you awaken to see a world of confusion. A world where we're slaves to the technology we mastered, where information gets sold by some rich, greedy bastard. A world of self-interest, self-image, self-promotion, where we all share our best bits, but leave out the emotion. We're at our most happy with an experience we share, but is it the same if no one is there? Be there for your friends, and they'll be there too, but no one will be if a group message will do. We edit and exaggerate, crave adulation, We pretend not to notice the social isolation. We put our words into order until our lives are glistening. We don't even know if anyone is listening. Being alone isn't a problem. Let me just emphasize, if you read a book, paint a picture, or do some exercise, you're being productive and present, not reserved and recluse. You're being awake and attentive and putting your time to good use. So when you're in public and you start to feel alone, put your hands behind your head, step away from the phone. You don't need to stare at your menu or at your contact list. Just talk to one another, learn to coexist. I can't stand to hear the silence of a busy commuter train where no one wants to talk through the fear of looking insane. We're becoming unsocial. It no longer satisfies to engage with one another and look into someone's eyes. 
We're surrounded by children who since they were born have watched us living like robots and think it's the norm. It's not very likely you'll make world's greatest dad if you can't entertain a child without using an iPad. When I was a child I'd never be home. Be out with my friends on our bikes we would roam. I'd wear holes in my trainers and graze up my knees. We'd build our own clubhouse high up in the trees. Now the park's so quiet it gives me a chill. See no children outside and the swings hanging still. There's no skipping, no hopscotch, no church and no steeple. We're a generation of idiots, smartphones and dumb people. So look up from your phone, shut down the display. Take in your surroundings, make the most of today. Just one real connection is all it can take to show you the difference that being there can make. Be there in the moment that she gives you the look that you remember forever as when love overtook. The time she first holds your hand or first kiss your lips. The time you first disagree but still love her to bits. The time you don't have to tell hundreds of what you've just done because you want to share this moment with just this one. The time you'll sell your computer so you can buy a ring for the girl of your dreams who is now the real thing. The time you want to start a family and the moment when you first hold your little girl and get to fall in love again. The time she keeps you up at night and all you want is rest and the time you wipe away the tears as your baby flees the nest. The time your baby girl returns with a boy for you to hold and the time he calls you granddad and makes you feel real old. The time you take in all you've made just by giving life attention and how you're glad you didn't waste it by looking down at some invention. The time you hold your wife's hand, sit down beside her bed you tell her that you love her, lay a kiss upon her head. She then whispers to you quietly, as her heart gives a final beat, that she's lucky she got stopped by that lost boy in the street. But none of these times ever happened. You never had any of this. When you're too busy looking down, you don't see the chances you miss. So look up from your phone, shut down those displays. We have a finite existence, a set number of days. Don't waste your life getting caught in the net as when the end comes, nothing's worse than regret. I am guilty too of being part of this machine, this digital world we are heard but not seen, where we type as we talk and we read as we chat, where we spend hours together without making eye contact. So don't give in to a life where you follow the hype, give people your love, don't give them your like. Disconnect from the need to be heard and defined, Go out into the world, leave distractions behind. Look up from your phone, shut down that display. Stop watching this video, live life the real way. <laughs>
I've lost something. I've lost my free will and I've lost my independence. And above all, I want to be independent and free. And so with a distorted framework of a worldly culture at work in our heart, we resist the best thing that's being offered to us. Because in the kingdom, submission is gain, not loss. Submission is gain, not loss. And when we start to understand that, we'll see that when we come to a covenant relationship with Jesus, the only place is down, out of our old life, so that we can be lifted up into a new life. But if we don't know the one we are putting our trust in, you'll struggle with it. And that's a worry for me because church has become anything but knowing Jesus. It's become about everything else. It's become about the the, the performance. It's become about this. It's become about that. The one thing Jesus said that brings you life is to know him. Relationship. And because relationship is not normal for us anymore, we have to work at it. We have to be intentional towards it. And that's why I'm willing to spend a whole session in the presence of God to learn how to have relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because I can preach it, but we don't understand it. Because our life experience has no measurement by which we can take the truth and make it real. Because the truth is so divorced from our culture. And what happens is many of us, we sort of come to the altar of this covenant of salvation with Jesus and we sort of do barleys. Submit and obey. Uh, Yeah, not that part. I love the rest of it. I love what you're going to give me, but submit and obey. I don't like those vows. And you know, I was so blessed yesterday. Tony uh, did Ben and Deb's wedding. And we remarked to ourselves there was a good old phrase there. And it was a phrase of submission. A good old phrase. Because we don't want to talk about that anymore. We don't, we don't want to have that idea that we're somehow not equal with one another. But I want to suggest this to you. We say we love God. And we say we want all of his life. But it's a little bit like Bali's at the altar. We say on our terms. Tracy and I got married nearly 30 years ago. And we'd had a bit of a blue the night before we got married. Such was our wonderful life of two strong-headed individuals. As you see, Tracy's bowing down now. I know, that's the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Anyway, we get to the altar, and my bride's looking beautiful. But when it came to the vows to love and obey, Tracy went Barley's. And that's a true story. You see, just like a marriage, and just like Philippians 2 says, we have to learn, we have to learn submission through Humble obedience. Christ learnt how to humble himself through obedience. He had to learn that the authority of the Father in his life was powerful to give him life. When he was willing to go low, he would cause the life flow of the authority and the love and the generosity of the Father to pour into his heart and pour into his life. And this is the model that we need to teach ourselves about. It's not about being standing up and being right all the time. If you, I think Tony said it yesterday, it was so profound. He said, if you're having an, I might be paraphrasing or, or, or misquoting you, Tony. So if I adapt it for the good, it's mine. If it's for the bad, it's yours. So he, he said something like this. He said that, that if you're in an argument, you're doing all the talking, you're in the wrong. Think about that for a moment. Because we so want to be upright, stand up in ourself, instead of being low in Christ to have life. It's when you're low in Christ, you access the full weight and the full authority of heaven into your life. Authority is love. You see, God is love and his authority is founded on his love. It's not founded on anything. The kingdom is built out of the very attribute of God. And the one attribute that we know 
from Scripture is God is love. That's why he never put you on the performance treadmill in a relationship. You see, we live under a performance paradigm that if I'm good, God will be good to me. If I love God, then maybe he'll love me. But God says, you can't live that way because that's the way of the world. He says, the way of the kingdom is I just keep loving you. I keep loving you. I keep loving you because that's who I am. And that's who I want you to become. And when, when you move in the way of love, the authority of heaven, the weight of his justice and his righteousness, his truth, and all the power and the resources of heaven are tied up with that authority because that's his will. God's will and his authority are the same thing. And so what he does is he allows a flow to take place. And Jesus teaches us very, very profoundly. He says, look, someone greater than the temple is here. You're used to a system of rules. You're used to temple worship. You're used to external laws shaping your obedience. And we have to ask ourselves, why did God give those external laws to his people? Because they were hard of heart. They were prideful. They saw themselves equal as God. They worshipped other gods. In other words, those other gods reified or built up their self-image of who they were. In other words, they were not submitted to God. They were as God. And it stopped the flow of the kingdom. So he gives them some commandments. Now, Here's how culture affects language. A commandment, if you're a military type person, it's an order. Boom, commandment, you must obey. If you're in a family setting, the word command looks a bit better. It's a little softer, but no less more powerful. If you're in a very licentious society, then command is an option you choose because you're still king. The greatest thing about submission that Jesus was teaching is it comes from the heart, not by laws. The law was given as a command simply to be a revelation of how to learn to live in submission so the kingdom could flow through them. Amazing. And, he, and God taught them. He said, look, if you obey, the kingdom will flow. You'll come into your promises. But if you disobey, then you will bring yourself under a curse. Now, hear my language intentionally. You will bring yourself. Not I will bring you under. You will bring yourself under. If you obey, heaven will start to flow through you. All the nations will look at you. The promises will be established. But you're going to have to trust me in this. But if you don't want to obey, then... Something that you're causing through your decision because you're responsible and self-governing will flow in your life. It's called a curse. The blessing is the picture of true authority, heaven to earth. It's where God says, I bend down. The word simply means bent knee. It says, when you obey, you access through submission all I want to give you. When you disobey... The word curse in the Hebrew means to spit on. You spit on yourself. Now, which one would you prefer? Submit, be lifted up into God so that all of the kingdom comes through you because hidden in the laws were the principles of the kingdom. Or would you prefer to do it your way, rejecting God's way, which is the pattern of the world, with you at the center, and you say, no, 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 I prefer to... I'm spitting on your loving revelation that I may have life. Now, that's a whole new way of looking at what a command is. So a command is a teaching from a loving father to his children to say, I want you to experience the fullness of life. I want you to experience all that I have and I want to give you generously. But you've got to learn the whole idea about how you access that and it's called through submission to godly authority. Does that make sense? But the Israelites were hard of heart. 
And so Jesus comes as the true Israel, and he says, okay, guys, let's start again. I'll show you how it's done. And Jesus often makes this point through the Gospels. He said, I only ever do what I see my Father doing. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It's his will that I'm doing. He uses these words. What is the language he's using? He says, this is actually submission. And I know the safest, most powerful place I can live is submitted wholly and utterly to the Father. Because then through submission, I gain the full access to the fullness of the authority that's in heaven so I can manifest it on earth. Does that make sense? So what grace does for us is it gets us out of the whole idea of earning the promises and earning our righteousness. That's great. Now we are declared righteous before God and we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. But the key is how on earth do I get the grace access of what's in heaven on earth? So Jesus says, I'll teach you. Watch my life and I will teach you. I will show you how it's done. It's done by loving God. It's done by loving God. And when you love God and you start to know God, what Jesus teaches in John 15 is submission, obedience will be really easy. It will be natural because you'll start to see things in the right perspective, not from a worldly cultural perspective. You'll start to see things that from the perspective of, from the perspective of the kingdom from heaven to earth, you'll start to see my heart towards you. You start to see all the benefits that flow into your life when you honor my authority. Because my authority is whilst over you to protect you, it comes under you to do the heavy lifting. I tweeted recently, <laughs> social media, I tweeted Recently, for all those that use social media, when you fully submit your life to Jesus Christ, God does all the heavy lifting. He does all the heavy lifting. And this idea of submission to God then outworks itself in submission towards one another, to submission to other realms of authority. And here's the thorny bit for us that Paul says in Romans 13. He said, this idea of submission is actually giving honor. And he says, you're to have this submission and this honor even towards worldly authority. Because the principle doesn't change. The principle is when you honor authority, you're actually honoring God. And he causes the kingdom to flow through that place of honor. Submission is an action from the heart of the expression of love called honor. So that when we honor one another, we are actually sitting in the authority of God. And as we access each other by love and respect and honor, then what happens as we submit to one another, heaven starts to invade. It's not about being above each other. So there are different realms in which we need to understand this truth. The first realm is that Jesus made it really, really clear that we are not God. There's a little truth for you. As much as we are sons of God, we are not God. Who would agree with that proposition? Okay. Then how do we make our decisions? If I'm not God theologically, then how do I make my decisions? I make my decisions as I am God. Because anything that challenges me in God's word or the move of the spirit into my heart that I'm not used to, not comfortable with, don't agree with, I reject. Instead of repositioning my life to say, you know what, Lord, I don't completely understand it, but I trust you. I completely trust you. I know that you are good. I know that you are generous. I know that you love me beyond anyone in this world. Should I, be, should I be concerned about that? Let me go to the cross and remind myself again of what you took on your body as me. Let me remind myself again that all of the promises were sealed 
by what you did? Could there be a greater expression of love? That's the wisdom of God for you and I and our heart. That's why we come through the cross up to be seated in authority. You can't just jump to authority. You've, something's got to die with you with Jesus for you to come into authority. So when I keep making decisions that are inconsistent with the way of love, the way of righteousness, the way of justice, the way of honour, respect, according to Scripture, not the culture of the day, then I am resisting the heaven breaking into my life and through my life. I'm stopping the flow. It's fully available by grace. But there has to be something of a faith, love, action on earth that accesses that which is in heaven and says it can flow through me. And the key is submission. The key is submission. Love and authority give. Submission receives. So when we come to what Paul writes to the Ephesians in the most thorny, thorny letter, because it talks about husbands and wives, and we love to, we love to use this this scripture in counselling. Who, who knows about the phrase? Ladies, I'll ask you if you know about this phrase. Because men, men love to quote it, but they don't quote it in context. Submit. Ladies, women, wife, submit to your husband. Now, if we have a wrong cultural view and expression and example of that, it's going to be harmful. But if we have a proper view of that, it's going to cause heaven to break into your marriage. Now, this is the thorny bit. We're going to have to go a bit lower, each husband and wife. But we've got to see the context in which Paul puts this. Because this idea of submission and honor, authority, increase, is a myriad of expressions that operates at every level of relationship. And if we don't know how to have relationship, we can't access the kingdom on earth. Does that make sense? That's why I showed you that slide. If we're engaged in social media, electronic media, to the exclusion of developing relationships, can I ask you, how's the kingdom meant to flow from you? If you've got no connection point to God, and you've got no connection point to anyone else, how is the kingdom meant to flow through you? Yet, yeah, that is what we're born again for. And God says, I'll give you the recipe, I'll give you the key, all the law and the prophets, all the Old Testament, all the rules are now finished, and they can be summed up. There's a shift. There's a change. Love the Lord your God. Love one another. That is the paradigm of power that causes the kingdom to flow in and through your life. It's what Jesus modeled. He didn't want us to get bent out of shape with the heavy yoke of religion. He wanted to come into the easy yoke of relationship. But here's the thing. As Mike said last week, we actually enjoy religion because it's more comfortable than actually having a relationship. Who finds relationships really easy? Come and talk to me afterwards and give me some lessons. We're not comfortable in a crowd. Who's comfortable in a crowd? Who's comfortable meeting new people? All right, 97% no. We don't naturally all have that personality, do we? Would that be fair? Are you there this morning? So how do we overcome this ability to give expression to who we really are if we're not comfortable with it? Where's the only place we can be empowered? In Christ, through the work of the Holy Spirit, dealing with the issues of our heart, because most of us live in the fear of men instead of the fear of God. And the fear of God, the reverential fear of God, which is honor, is the beginning of wisdom. It's not all wisdom, it's the beginning of wisdom. So unless you, reverent, if you, unless you reverently engage God as he is God and you're not, you're going to think your wisdom is equal to his wisdom. And Paul tells the Corinthian church, who are a bunch of smart people in Greek philosophy and, and all of those sorts of things, very stoic, he says, look, your best wisdom is the lowest point of God. God's wisdom transcends all of your wisdom, yet you don't want to come to it. Now, that's foolishness, isn't it? 
Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 5. I'm reading from the message because I love the language of it. Watch what God does and then you do it. Watch what God does and then you do it. Well, tell me, how are you going to do that if you don't have a relationship and a connection to God, either through the Word or through the Spirit or both? Because how are you going to know what God's doing? So sometimes we don't have the revelation, but we have an example. And so if we don't have the revelation, we go to the example. Who's the example? Jesus. So we go, okay, Jesus demonstrated perfect theology. So if I'm able to look at the life of Jesus and how he dealt with situations, then there's a fair chance the Holy Spirit's going to be in that and lead me into good life decisions. Watch what God does and then you do it. Like children whom learn proper behavior from their parents. It's relational. Mostly what God does is, love, is to love you. Mostly what God does is love you. I'll tell you why. True submission flows out of an atmosphere of love, not fear. We are so used to living in an atmosphere of fear-based submission, it will not cause the flow of life that only comes from your heart, love, submission. Does that make sense? So we can teach you rules all day. And if you follow those rules, heaven is not going to invade earth. Heaven was revealed in Jesus. It was always present. It was always available. The kingdom was hidden. But when Jesus came, he said, I'm going to give you access to it. And it's through relationship, not through a bunch of starchy religious rules. Because you can't, that's, that's, that is, those rules were designed for when you were really, really young. That it would point to something greater. So that, because you didn't understand the values of my heart, I instructed you to we got to a representation of the values of who I really am, and that's what you're meant to live from. How many of you, as adults, would would love if each week we had a set of religious rules and we said, "Go clean up your room. Go clean up your room. Go do this. Go do that." Go do that, go do that, go do that, go do that. And then if you're really good, you can come out for dinner. How many, of, how many people would love that? That's Christianity 101. How many of you would love it? Now, none of us would love it because we think it's patronising, and it is. But maturity requires responsibility. To move from instruction to maturity, we need a relationship. We need to know how to have a relationship and honour and respect one another and who each person is in all of their colour, all of their gifting and all of their diversity. Because when we do that, we start to fulfil scripture and heaven starts to break in. Amen? Look what he says. Mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. It's the hardest life to live, if we're completely honest. You can't do it in of yourself. I can't. I need God's love pouring into my life because I know how vulnerable I am on some of those love issues. So I've got to go lower so his love comes in more. I've got to understand my weakness so that I can gain his strength. And it's not condemning. I don't feel condemned by that. I feel alive in that because I go, I'm not God. And God, you are God, and you are life. And when I commit my life to you, you promise to protect me. You promise to lift me up. You promise to empower me. Oh, I need some of that today. And I start to come up with him because I've gone down with him. Humility, submission, work in love to empower us like never before. And Paul goes on. He said, observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. See, that's God's authority. That's his love. Oh, my goodness. Love like that. That's what Paul's telling the church. Love like Jesus did. 
Don't allow love to turn into lust, setting off a downhill slide into sexual promiscuity, filthy practices or bullying greed. Though some tongues just love the taste of gossip, Christians have better uses for language than that. Don't talk dirty or silly. That kind of talk doesn't fit our style. Thanksgiving is our dialect. You can be sure that using people or religion or things just for what you can get out of them, the usual variations of idolatry, will get you nowhere and certainly nowhere near the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God. Don't let yourselves be taken in by religious smooth talk. I love this. God gets furious with people who are full of religious sales talk but wants nothing to do with him. Don't even hang around people like that. You groped your way through the murk once but no longer. You're out in the open now. The bright light of Christ makes your way plain. So no more stumbling around. Get on with it. The good, the right, the true. These are the actions appropriate for daylight hours. Figure out what will please Christ and then do it. Don't waste your time on useless work, mere busy work, the barren pursuits of darkness. Expose these things for the sham they are. It's a scandal when people waste their lives on things they must do in the darkness where no one will see. Rip the cover off those frauds and see how attractive they look in the light of Christ. Wake up from your sleep. Climb out of your coffins. Christ will show you the light. So watch your step. Use your head. Make the most of every chance you get. These are desperate times. Don't live carelessly, unthinkingly. Make sure you understand what the master wants. Don't drink too much wine. That cheapens your life. Drink the spirit of God. Huge drafts of him. Sing hymns instead of drinking songs. Sing songs from your heart to Christ. That's what we did this morning. Sing praises over everything. Any excuse for a song to God the Father in the name of our Master Jesus Christ. Out of our respect for Christ, be courteously reverent to one another. Then he goes on to talk about different levels of authority. I don't want to get there this morning. It's Mother's Day. We'll get there on Father's Day, maybe. (laughs) But I want you to see something important. When we understand that we build our life by yielding fully our life to God the Father in Jesus Christ, just like Jesus did, we have the same hope and the same potential that Jesus had when he lived on earth. Jesus was submitted to the Father on earth, but equal with God in the Godhead. When Jesus submitted himself to the Father on earth, he was modeling as the Son of Man, all humanity, how we can live with heaven invading earth. Submission. It's not about what you lose. Properly understood, it's about everything you gain. Let's pray. Yeah, sure. Come say something. Next Sunday um, is my 40th wedding anniversary. And in a way, I've actually only been married 20 years to my husband. I wasn't a Christian when I got married and things got worse because I was not into submission and didn't know anything about it really. And when we were coming up to our 20th wedding anniversary, I'd been a Christian about five years and I had grabbed hold of Christ because my marriage was in trouble. And of course, God was changing me, but it was scary for my husband. It wasn't what he bargained for and it wasn't what I thought was going to happen in my life because we actually got married in a registry office because I didn't believe in God. 
So things were changing and being turned upside down even more. And the week before our 20th wedding anniversary, I cried in church with some friends and we prayed and prayed because I was going to go and live with my brother. I was leaving my husband. And I'd cursed him to everybody. I'd told him told everybody how horrible he was and what a horrible man and how unhappy I was. And the, we had planned, I'd planned for us to go away for our 20th wedding anniversary. And I was so mad the week before because he'd done something again and it was terrible and I, I couldn't go on anymore and now how could we go away? But in that prayer time the week before, I felt God say, go away, trust me and still go. And so that following weekend, we went away, just down to Glenelg. And we arrived about six o'clock Friday night in this lovely little apartment by the beach. And all of a sudden it was like, it wasn't like it was. The Holy Spirit came within me and said to me, Helen, you have to apologise to your husband. You have to say sorry. And all those years I thought, why do I have to say sorry? You know, what a, he's done this and he's done that. But God said that to me and I believed him. And I thought, yeah, that's what I've got to do. And I looked at my husband and I said, before we have this weekend, I want to say something to you. I want to say how sorry I am for all the things I've said about you and all the things I've done. And I want you to forgive me. Can you forgive me? And he just said simply, yes. <laughs> but there was a shift and I felt it. It was like the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit came into our marriage and healed it there and then. Thank you. And from that day forward, he built our marriage and he built a trust, a new trust. He took away all the disappointments, the feelings of broken promises, the hurts that I had carried and was making me have a hard heart and want to be revengeful to him and get back at him and get back at him. And so, yes, next, next Sunday is our 40th. And I just... I thank God every day, you know. I learn about submission that day because I realise God is a God of justice. And when we, if we are wronged, God will sort it out. We don't have to stand up and say, you are going to do this and you're going to do that. He will bring justice. And so that submission... Although I'm, I know I'm still working on it, <laughs> but he's done such a work in me in that that I don't feel I have to defend my honour to, to my husband. In fact, he defends my mm. honour. He stands by my side. And he, you know, last year he stood up on Mother's Day at our family dinner that I'd prepared and he said, before you all eat, everybody... I want to thank Helen for all the cooking and the hard work she's done. And that was like so huge for my husband. And I just, you know, I, I encourage you. I encourage you to let God talk to you about what you need to do. And you will see the rewards. You really will. Thank you. Very good. Wow. I'm, I'm so encouraged when I look at scripture that it is a journey. And, you know, the disciples, 
They all wanted to sit at the right hand of Jesus. Remember that? They wanted to be the big it, the big kahunas. We're up there with you, Jesus. He said, yeah, yeah, sure. You can be great in the kingdom when you learn to become the servant of all. In other words, you, you're going to have to learn how to submit. You're going to have to learn how to move in the way of love to tra- carry true authority. And when you read the letters of John and Paul at the end of their lives, Peter's life, you see something profound. They learn the power of humility and submission to gain the power of the resurrection and the authority of the kingdom. And that is what they are imploring us, exhorting us to say it doesn't look like the world you can't change a world if you live by its values you can only change the world if you live by a different world and Jesus has not just given you the exemption from punishment he's invited you in to the world of his father and says go reveal it let everyone see that there is a hope there is a glory and this is the this is the joy that was set before him, that you would live fully full of God with the kingdom flowing through you. Is there any other pursuit that is worthwhile if we're going to be authentic? I think not. So today, enjoy each other. Enjoy family because God loves family. Enjoy each other. Respect each other. Honor each other. Give dignity and value to each other. And where it hurts... Say, God, I need some of your grace. Where you can't, go lower rather than going higher. Say less and reveal more. Bless you.